finally another book club. We read Life of the Party this time. I haven't read this book since it was published in 2014, uh, and I had forgotten almost all of it. And I'm, I, I mean, it was kind of interesting to reread it. And I was really nervous for Kirsten and Kathy to reread it because, you know, a lot of it's about Bert in his younger years before he knew me. And he's just a big, goofy bro. And he's got a lot of bro stories that aren't super politically correct. Um, Not sure the demographic of this book is definitely not a 50-year-old woman, housewife, mother. Probably if you have a college student. They are, would like this book. Anybody who's a fan of Bert would like this book to see kind of some of his origin stories, I guess. But it was fun to read and it was fun to talk about with Kathy and Kirsten. We always have a good time. So this author reached out to me and asked if we would read her book and on my podcast. And I said, sure. And it is called The Feel Good Effect by Robin Conley Downs. The Feel Good Effect, reclaim your wellness by finding small shifts that create big change. I am super interested in reading this book. So it's right up my alley. So um, I couldn't remember the name of the book at the end of the episode, but this is the name of the book. Um, So read it. Join us for our next book club if you'd like. There's still a few pairs of Free Waters house shoes at freewaters.com. If you uh, want to order some for your New Year's, you can. Life of the Party is available at BurtBurtBurt.com where he sells a signed copy there, or you can just buy it at Amazon. But there's a link on my website, WifeOTP.com, under the Book Club tab. There's a link to this book uh, for Amazon. I have not listened to this audiobook, but I hear it's awesome. Bert read it, and Bert is dyslexic, and he, I mean, I was in the recording session going, Oh, my God. I'm not even sure this is a good idea. But from what I hear, it's really entertaining. So if you prefer to get an audiobook version um, and hear Bert read it himself, that might be really fun, too. So thank you for coming back every week. Thank you for sharing and uh, commenting. And thank you for your emails and for subscribing to everything I do on YouTube and Instagram and all that good stuff. And I know it's Christmas Day. No, it's Christmas Eve. So I hope everyone has a lovely Christmas. Those of you who are celebrating Christmas, um, we are making chicken fried steak and gravy and biscuits tonight for dinner. I make it once a year on Christmas Eve, and I will be doing that today when this episode drops. So have a very Merry Christmas. I hope everyone had a happy Hanukkah, a happy new year, and I'll see you next week on New Year's Eve. I look like a beauty queen. Oh, thank you. You look gorgeous. Oh, oh, whatever. You, you are in my Christmas in my Christmas flannel. I love it. I love flannel. I don't know why flannel is not just like everywhere. I, I didn't really yeah. on this company that Sandy turned me in, into onto is called Uniqlo. It's an, oh yeah. Japanese line. I think yeah, it's, it's really reasonably priced. Really reasonably priced, and it's cut for my body. Nice. It's not cut for a six foot tall person. Mm-hmm. It's cut for a tiny little, I guess, Asian person since it's a Japanese company. But everything fits me like it's supposed to fit. And so, That's awesome. I was there last year, and I was like, they have flannel collared shirts. I am buying every color, and I live in them. I love flannel. That's what you got to do when you find a thing, a place that works for you. Just buy yep. it all. Wipe them out or make your own yeah. clothes, but whatever. I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. Wow. Hi, Kathy. Good morning, ladies. How are you? Are you? How are you doing? Okay. Sorry, I'm late. That's, you're not, are you late? You're one minute late. I have no idea. Okay, good. I'm only one minute late. I'm going Kathy, to your hair is so long too. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. You think? Yeah. It hasn't Longer been cut in a while, but yeah. yeah. Um, we fancy people over here have a hairdresser come to our house in our backyard and cut all our hair. Because nice. my hair, the longer it gets, it, it starts going like this. <laughs> it looks <laughs> terrible. If I don't keep it short, it has no body and it just sucks. My yeah, Irish likewise. Hair. Yeah. yeah. So, but yours likewise. doesn't do That's that. Why. Yours is no, fluffy. But this is curled. <laughs> <laughs> this um, is me actually taking some time to curl it because it wants to be just 
straight so that, yeah, the longer it gets, the more it like weighs down. Yeah. That's why I was like keeping it shorter. And it was like, oh yeah, I feel a little bit more peppy. My hair wants to be a bit more peppy. And I haven't had my hair cut in a year now. Isn't that crazy? So, I've had yeah. mine cut once since this like quarantine stuff. Yeah. Oh, you guys are lucky. You're just not gray. I have so much gray. Oh, I'm no, I'm totally gray. I do it at home. I color the roots at home. <laughs> do you? I do. You're so brave. I'm a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, Leos are very hair oriented. And the <laughs> one part of the Leo that I have is not the hair do, but I have to have a good cut. And I cannot have gray hair. Like I'm not, my mother-in-law's a Leo and she, we call her the quaff because she will spend <laughs> an hour on her hair do. I don't, I, mine dries by itself, but I have to have a good cut, which is why it looks decent when it dries by itself. And I, I the gray, I can't deal with it. I have to have. Yeah, I can't deal ready. with the gray either. I, you know, in the beginning of quarantine, I, I let it go for as long as possible, even though I was doing my roots at home. I, I let it go for as long as possible thinking, you know, let's just see, let's see if I can accept it. Let's see if I can accept so it. So funny, I did the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And so and then I just had dark hair. It was you. terrible. Oh. I had like dark but yours, but was it just dark and not gray? Because mine was yes. like. I have like one gray. gray streak and that's it. And then it's brunette. And then it's dirty blonde. Okay. Dirty blonde. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just I realized after that experiment. Oh, she wants to sit up Mona. here with us, so she's gonna. Be I realized after that experiment, I was like, no, I I'm just happier <laughs> <laughs> when the gray is covered up. It just <sighs> it's depressing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like we need one more thing to be depressed. <laughs> No, exactly. I mean, some people really pull it off. You know, there's like those yeah. glamorous women who are like, they let it all go gray. And you're like, oh my God, you look amazing. I just don't feel it. I don't feel it for me. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I'm not ready. Maybe in my 60s. Not ready. Yeah. Maybe in my 60s, but not right now. Okay. So Kirsten, I'm going to talk to Kathy about something that I'm going to get you in the loop in, but I got to talk to you about this, Kathy. So okay. <laughs> the campers oh, God. are doing something we came up with on a podcast. So the four camper women podcasted a couple weeks ago about this secret Santa dinner thing. It is stressing me out. Is it stressing you out? So we've had arguments over this oh thing. Like God. it is okay. so ridiculous. Okay, like, so for people who yeah. missed that episode, our four families, Kathy, mine, Lynn, and Sandy's, all our group called the Campers, and we spend a lot of time together during Christmas and this year because of the pandemic. Obviously, we can't do that. So Sandy came up with this brilliant idea, <laughs> which we, kind of was brilliant. It was like, brilliant. In its like infancy, was in its, brilliant. In its simplest form. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It was brilliant. And that is where we have a secret Santa and each family cooks a meal for their secret Santa family and drops it off like all at the same time. And then we zoom and have dinner together. And we usually exchange they, the kids draw names for Christmas Eve. So we usually exchange gifts on Christmas Eve. So we were going to no, are we exchanging? Yeah, we're, are we exchanging? No, we're not exchanging gifts. Never mind. Take no, no, no. That no that's still Christmas. Just a dinner. Right. Secret Santa dinner, all dropped off. And then you have to guess who cooked your dinner, right? Mm -hmm. And if you guess wrong, you put $100 in the pot. That was the original, right? Yes. That was this there, there were some thing. flaws in the original plan, granted, but yes, that was the, that's her original presentation. Yes. And I was like, sounds amazing. Lynn and Kathy were a bit more cautious, <laughs> but I was like, I am, let's do this. This is going to be fun. Something to do. Oh my, I've been so stressed out about this stupid dinner because at first there were no like real rules. And then Sandy was like, we need to zoom and have some rules. It has to be edible. Thought that was kind of obvious. Didn't think this was a joke meal. And Sandy, I think, really wanted someone to cook her a really nice meal, not realizing she would then also have to cook someone else a really nice meal. So it's not really getting her what she wanted. So we've had two Zoom meetings about this, all eight adults. 
finally got everything ironed out and we're each cooking a French meal, appetizer, main course, dessert, including wine and delivering it. It's been so stressful, Kathy. Talk to me. Have you been yes. this stressful? Yes. Like we couldn't decide on the menu. Stephen and I spent literally 45 minutes again last night. Lily like gave up. She wanted to be <laughs> part of it. And then she's like, peace out, people. I'm done with this. And we kept going back and forth and back and forth. And he's like adamant we have to make this. And I'm like, well, I don't fucking care anymore. Just make whatever. Like we'll order pizza. I don't care anymore. And this is not French. I know. I'm you can't order pizza. <laughs> you can't order anything. It's not French. <laughs> um, but like you can't order French can't fries. Then. <laughs> yeah. So I think we finally honed in on our menu. We're doing this tomorrow. So now we have to like get all of our ingredients and cook this by tomorrow night. So. So my brilliant household, we came up with a menu, a main course and dessert really fast. Mm -hmm. The appetizer course was really difficult. Tricky. So we finally came up with that last night. I Instacarted all the groceries in double because Bert wants to do a trial run tonight because he liked the menu so much. <laughs> he wanted us to have the menu and have a trial run and then cook it again tomorrow. So I'm cooking this damn meal twice. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> the, my main course that got shot down, Stephen's like, um, that's really good. Let's make that. I'm like, but why can't we make it for our like dinner? He's like, no, right? no. yeah. So, so I don't know how I'm know. transporting all this food. I don't know how I put it. Like, in, I, it's just been it's super fun. Yes, <laughs> it's way more complicated than it needs to be. Like the whole idea, like let's make someone else dinner. Like how sweet is that? I would love to do that for someone. And now it's just, now it's it like I was joking with Stephen because like, there's now all these rules and it became this like really sweet thing. And now it is like this reality TV show. <laughs> it is some combination of like big brother, amazing race, <laughs> iron chef, great, greatest bake off, whatever. I'm like, are you fucking kidding with, by the way, we're supposed to provide behind the scenes footage of us making it. We are. Your husband said that. Do you not remember this? No, I, I'm not I doing it by the way. But yes, your husband was like, this is how we're going to know who's really made what food. We're all going to text behind the scenes footage. Oh, so I blocked that out. Oh, I didn't hear that. I blocked that. Out. <laughs> but the rules, we have to cover our like surveillance devices. Our ring hey. doorbells have to be taped over. <laughs> we were at one point going to meet in one parking lot and go in four different directions so no one could see where anybody was going to figure out who was oh dropping God. off so where. Ridiculous. And uh, what was another? Then we were going to have everyone come to one house and put all their stuff in a bag and <laughs> separate into the four corners of the yard and eat out of the bag. I mean, it was just it's so, it's so stupid. So, it was how long was that Zoom call to figure this out? Way longer minutes? than it needed to it be. I swear to God. One. The second one was like 45 minutes long. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> so yeah, I've been like, I I don't know. The like, two of my dishes are served in what they're cooked in. Oh. So I'm like. Everybody knows my cookware. Right. I have to know, go buy cookware <laughs> so that I'm not found out because I don't want to put $100 in the pot. So if someone guesses that I cooked for them, I got to put 100 bucks in the pot. So I'm spending like $400 on cookware to not spend $100 in the pot <laughs> because I must win. We must win, right? It's <laughs> unclear how you actually win, though. Like we're just putting money yeah. in this pot and it just stays there. As far as we know, Sandy just gets it. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, think whoever has her should just tape hundred dollars to her bag and be done with it. <laughs> but hundred dollars is not enough. She wants she the wants pot. 400. She wants to for figure out how to win the pot. So she's assuming all four of us guess wrong and there'll be four hundred dollars in this pot. Right. But one of that hundred is hers. Yeah. So she's really only getting three hundred. As, a, as an Asian, not to be stereotypical, she's not great at math. She's not great at math. So or losing. <laughs> definitely not good at losing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm unclear what happens with the pot. Actually, she 
the suggester of the pot is unclear what should happen with the pot, but there should definitely be a pot. Yes. And she should definitely somehow get it. <laughs> yeah, somehow it's her pot. Yeah. She and Tom will get that pot. Yeah. Anyway, I'm mm-hmm. glad to hear, I'm not glad, but I am glad to hear that you're as stressed as I am. This meal yeah. has fucking stressed me out. It could be so simple. It and could fun. Be. I mean, we already it had a menu fun. planned before this big Zoom meeting. We had our whole menu planned. Yeah. And we planned it based on the people whose name we drew right. and, and what they, they like really enjoy. We were yeah. like, we're going to make a meal that they would really enjoy. Every family member would enjoy every dish. We were on the same page. Yeah. Are you really? Yes. But now have the family first members. rule, make it edible. I was like, what game are we playing? <laughs> Like, who the fuck thought it wasn't going to be edible? At what point was that ever a consideration? (laughs) I'm going to give you a rubber chicken (laughs) with with some fake leaves and call it a salad. Have fun. Okay, here's a fun rule number one. It has to be edible. And we were like, (laughs) yeah, obviously. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not alone. No, you're not. Do you think Lynn is stressed? Probably, yeah. Yeah, probably so. I mean, she was, you know, texting about the rules yesterday to clarify that she didn't get anything wrong, you know? (laughs) Are we or are we not providing wine with this meal? And we were like, we are, we are, we are, we are. (laughs) Definitely wine. Um, (laughs) Maybe some champagne too. Maybe it's unclear. You know, just go for the gold. (laughs) <laughs> what else do we have to do? We're in a pandemic. Yes. So after this podcast, I have to go find cooking <laughs> vessels for my dishes. I was able to Instacart everything, but I can't get the cooking vessels here from Amazon in time. In time. Mm-hmm. No, can't get them in time. I'm using disposable. So I assume that's what most people are doing. Oh, one of them I can't use disposable. The other one I may be able to, though. One of them I can't. One of them requires a cast iron. You guys are already giving away too much information. (laughs) Well, I figured everybody, like, because you know everyone's dishes, like, this is the only way to get around it, right? I just gave away too much. You're right, Kirsten. I just gave away. Poker (laughs) face, Kathy. You need a poker face when this I will have a poker face. If you see that, I'm I'm not even going to know. You know, I'm sure Sandy will come up with some kind of side bet that if you guess someone who cooked (laughs) someone else's dish, not realizing you could guess the dish you cooked, you cooked yourself, that person and get money out of the pot. I don't know. She'll come up with some side hustle. That woman. Anyway, man, perfect segue into what we're talking about today, because I married someone who only functions in these types of antics. Would you say that's correct? Yes. I think that's very true. Uh, We are talking about Bert's book today. This is our book club book, Life of the Party. And I have to say, um, I haven't read this book since it was published. I probably read this maybe 15 or 20 times in the process of writing it because I did not write this book at all, but I definitely helped. I don't know if edit it's the right word, but I helped him with like structure and and like, hey, this is a run-on sentence. Hey, you've said the word that 14 times in this sentence. I helped him with that, but I didn't help him with any. He wrote everything. And then I went and said and gave notes on it. And and so I don't know what that role is called. Yeah, editor. You edited it. Okay. Um, it's editor. 100% his voice. Um, oh, there's so, so many times it. when there was a sentence and I was like, this sentence could be so much better if you just said it like this, but then it's not his writing. So I just have to just correct the grammar, <laughs> just, just correct the grammar, <laughs> but you go, sorry. Yeah, it is his voice. So I was nervous after I started reading this again, I was nervous for you to read it because he is such a bro. So if you, if a person who doesn't know this person can read this book from the point of view of this is a window into how a very base dude thinks about things, it's very enlightening because Bert Kreischer functions from eat, sleep, drink, fuck. 
That's where he functions. And I think a lot of men at the base, not the whole man, but at the base, a lot of it comes from those same four places. And I think this book really (laughs) illustrates those four base places. And I actually, I don't think Bert would have written this book in this way today because I don't think they would have published it. It's funny. I was wondering actually when I reread it, because I read it the first time it came out. And I was like, when the hell did this thing come out? Because I couldn't remember actually. And it's been a while now. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. It's been quite some time. Yeah. I don't even remember when it was published either, but I just I looked, it was 2014. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's a long time. I didn't think it had been that long, but I didn't either. Well, and the stories are even mostly even older than that because um, Georgia is yeah. three at the end of the book and she wasn't three in 2014. No. Um, okay. And also like it's a, there are a lot of like college stories and that. So, um, yeah. So tell me what you thought and you can, you can say you didn't like it and you can say he was a jerk and I won't be offended because I know we all like Bert. We all love Bert. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I am. I will preface it by saying I am not this book's intended audience, <laughs> right? At all, a hundred percent. Um, and I will also preface it by saying that I am not a fan of fraternities and fraternity <laughs> guys. <laughs> so, um, a good chunk, like probably the first third or half of the book, is largely based on fraternity antics. And probably if I, like, if I didn't know Bert or wasn't like, if I, if I didn't know him as a person, but also if I didn't know him as a comedian, like I can see like reading it because I like him as a comedian and I can get through this part. But if I didn't know him for either of those things, me, (laughs) middle-aged Kirsten (laughs) would not have continued reading it. But I will also preface by saying that when I met Richard, and he was, I don't know, 2000. So he was 29. And um, I re- <laughs> he brings this up to this day that <laughs> I repeatedly, that I said, well, you're not in my tar- target age range. <laughs> he, was, he was too young for me. Like I didn't date college guys when I was in college. Like I was not interested in that bro energy. Yeah. So all of this is to preface, I am not this book's intended tar- target. Right. I'm not the target age range or person range of this book. None of us are, no. Yes, but um, there was a lot that I loved. I, I didn't love the fraternity stuff. Right, right. <laughs> I didn't love that stuff. But like to read it as a uh, Forrest Gump going through life, like in a lot of ways, Bert is like Forrest Gump, not mentally challenged, but... Like it, he, he has gone through these, like, it's like him meeting celebrities or just doing crazy things. Like he's done so many wild outlandish things. And, you know, a lot of them didn't even make it into the book because again, it was published in 2014, but um, to read it from that perspective, it was like, wow, all of this stuff has happened to this one guy. And this was, a lot of years ago, yeah, you know, right. a lot has happened since it's just, it's fascinating from that. And also it's just really fun. I mean, he's a funny guy, so it's in his voice and he's a hilarious guy and I love Bert. I, it, so reading it as somebody who loves Bert is also like, Oh, good Lord. You know, the, <laughs> the beginning part, Oh, good Lord. But then like, Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. And then to see his success happening is really exciting. Um, Oh, that's cool. And I flagged a lot of places. All of the places that I flagged are things that I'm like, oh, love it. Want to talk about it. Love it. Want to talk about it. Um, so it's not like this book was not for me. No, I know. No, honey, you, yeah. you are absolutely right. This is not <laughs> written for us. This was written for a college kid, really. I think yes. uh, the demographic that would enjoy this book and be like, wow, and get it is a college age kid. 
uh, boy in particular, man, young man. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of college young ladies would be like, oh, he's so sexy. I don't think so. Because I read some of this stuff and was like, how did I marry someone who stripped naked and shit on a pizza box? Why? Would, and, you know, I was in a sorority. And I was very into fraternity guys, but I would never have dated Bert Kreischer in college. Not ever. No way. That guy, I, no way. There's no way I would have dated him. So you're right. I mean, I think you gave a very gracious, as I was reading, I was like, Kirsten's going to kill me. He <laughs> says the word pussy 8,000 times in this book. Kirsten's going to be like, okay, I loved you. But it's over. This is over. I can't believe you edited this book and you left the word pussy in there 18 times. But, you know, that's who he is, really. And, and, and that's, I really do stand by what I say, is I think this is a window, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, into how guys at a base level in college think. You know, they just want to have fun and they want to get a girl in bed. That's what they want. They want to have fun, get a girl in bed, have fun, make stories, you know? I mean, some guys clearly are more focused or whatever. It's a blanket statement to say that. But from my experience in college, a lot of the fraternity guys were exactly like this. You know, what do you think, Kathy? Well, I think it's funny that you say that because when Kirsten was talking, I was like, (laughs) well, I went through most of my college experience with my husband. Who is this guy? He is right, right. You know, a much quieter version of Bert, but like these hijinks, the stupid fucking shit they did, the amount of women that he has conquered or tried to <laughs> before you, I, before I'm you, well aware of this, this brain, this mentality, and I feel like I, you know, I experienced a lot of that with him. So this uh, just made me laugh, really. Um, and I could totally see how you end up marrying somebody like that because you like, did actually who this person is, <laughs> except it kind of is. There's a piece that really is that person. Right. Um, I will say, though, I was thinking and I I was like, oh, I, there's a lot of this book that I didn't remember after reading it the first time. And the pizza box thing was something I think I really chose to pluck out. <laughs> I didn't ever remember that incident. Um, everything else sort of came back when I was reading it. But that one, I was like, yeah, didn't need to know that story. Yeah, that story is pretty intense as an adult. Now, yes. if I think back to my college self, yeah. I would have thought that was amazing. <laughs> this is a testament to how much we change as we mature Mm -hmm. and really to think about what we should expect of the young adults that live in our house. Not that they're going to be this person, but they're going to have a more ignorant, less experienced, less broad way of processing certain things where I mean like, Super easy example. Georgia, we're in lockdown in LA. Georgia wanted to go to a friend's house this week and we were like, absolutely not. And we're in lockdown. No way. And then we started feeling bad because she's like really getting upset. And we were like, well, tell us what you mean by that. Do you mean like sit in a chair across the yard from each other with a mask on? And she was like, no, I want to go play ping pong. I mean, it's outside. And we're like, yeah, but you touch a ball and then she touches the ball and then you touch the ball and you're touching this ball back and forth. No, she's not thinking like that. You know, in her little broad, narrow brain, she's like, we're outside. We're going to wear masks. We're in her backyard. We're not seeing anybody and else. Yeah. And we're see- the table is keeping us six feet apart, but you're touching a ping pong ball back and forth. And I know we are pretty sure that that's not how it's transmitted, but let's, you know, we're in lockdown. It's really bad right now. Why would we risk that? So to me, that's a very simplistic example of how kids think in this small box and it's still in the context of our box, but because we've lived more life and we've had more personal experiences with people, we have a different, broader perspective. And the book to me goes, I'm, I'm not sure Bert would shit on a pizza box now. 
<laughs> right? I don't think he would do that now at like a press junket for his you know, Netflix special. I'm pretty sure that would be a no. And I definitely would not think that was okay now. But in college, I would have been like, fuck yeah, that's crazy. Crazy Burt Kreischer. I'm not dating the guy, but crazy Burt Kreischer. I don't know. What do you think about that? What I just said? You think that's true or no? Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, part of that is, you know, it's this naive way of looking at the world. Like George is trying to follow all the rules. I'll stay six feet apart. I'll keep a mask on. And then it's also that piece where you're like, it doesn't matter. Touching a ping pong ball doesn't matter, mom. You know what I mean? Like they don't get it and they don't get the fear and all of the stuff that encompasses being a parent that goes along with that. They're in their very narrow, I'm a teenager. And if I don't get the fuck out of this house, I'm going to lose my mind. I need my my social interaction. Right. You know, if I don't win this election (laughs) by shitting on a pizza box, this other guy I deem a douchebag is going to take over and that is life or death. Right. That's what that story really was about. Like, we can't let this guy with his PowerPoint presentation run our run our fraternity. Right. So. Yeah, I don't know. It was an interesting window. And Bert is has grown so much since a lot of these stories, which is another, I think, good lesson in life to not um, maybe throw. I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say, not to maybe discount someone entirely to allow them to change and grow if they right, are like cancel yeah. culture. Yeah, yes, exactly. Like, like, yeah. Like if this book yeah. were published today, he would be totally canceled. Right. Partly because he's more known, well known today than he was in 2014. And partly because the culture has changed since 2014. And some of that change is good, but I wonder if all of it is good. If no one is allowed to say shitty, stupid stuff without being condemned for life, like canceled for life. You're canceled for good. You can't even make an apology and be redeemed. You can make an apology and you're still dead. Well, that's not, that's not very Christian. Yeah. I mean, it it doesn't make sense because when you are in college, you do stupid shit. And the point is to grow and learn from it. So the fact that this happened years ago, I mean, you can't hold that shit against somebody. Right. You know what? I don't know. Like it feels very, you know, I don't know. Maybe none of his stuff is so egregious that you're like, okay, so he was a stupid kid. Like whatever, like most of us were, you know? I mean, we all made stupid mistakes in college, things that we would just never do these days. Right. Yeah. The difference now is that if this stuff had happened now, shitting in a pizza box would be viral (laughs) on YouTube because (laughs) you know what I mean? Like there would have been a million cell phones out recording the incident. And so it's, um, it's definitely more palatable in book form. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. But, you know, that's an interesting point because legend, right? Mm -hmm. I would say that was probably a legendary act in his uh, fraternity. It was probably talked about for years. (laughs) But does legend happen? You know what I mean? Like anymore, because it is immortalized on camera. There's no, the, the retelling of something that happened that's major is very different than watching a video. It seems Agreed. more permanent when you are, when it is, you know, orally passed down. Absolutely. You're a hundred percent right. It seems less permanent. Not that you want this to be your permanent legend that you shit on a pizza box, but I mean, even the machine story, if that had been recorded, how would it have been different? His memory of it and the way that he tells that story and even the fighting a bear, you know, I'm sure on camera, It doesn't look, and you can't express what's going on inside someone's head, you know, on camera. Um, So it's a shame that that you're right. That's what would happen is if if a kid in election shit on a pizza box, it would go viral, but you wouldn't get to experience the rest of it, you know, in the storytelling of it. Um, You know, we were all there. We didn't know what was going on. This guy had his PowerPoint presentation. What a douchebag. He was definitely not going to win. We were like, hey, Kreischer, you know, you don't get any of that in a video. 
Yeah. Right. I I would love to, I would love for Bert to write another book um, because the parts of the book that I loved the most were um, when he was a little older and that like that legendary stuff is great and it neat, you know, you're right. It's when it, it's, when it's in a memoir, then it's like you get the context for it. But I, I love the context to the stuff of being a parent um, because he's just such a rounded human being now who has done crazy things like the machine and shooting a pizza box, et cetera, et cetera. But then now also there's all of that guy layered into being a parent and a husband. And um, I loved the later stuff. Yeah, I like I reread um, the last story when Georgia broke her jaw. And um, I liked how he talked about not wanting this vulnerability. Like best. Yes. Time when ever. he talked about being angry with you, mm-hmm. um, it, I loved that because it's so true. And that like, I can't relate to shitting in a pizza box. Like, do I look like someone who's ever. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if we get you, you drunk know. enough, maybe I'll hold your <laughs> hair while you shit on a pizza box. <laughs> But this stuff about feeling really angry, like he said, um, I was angry with my wife when we met. She said she had no intentions of changing who I was, the comedy, the drinking, the party, and she was all cool with, and I believed her. And then, but the guy she met back then, the old Bert would never have sobbed uncontrollably in the back of a taxi for 30 minutes. That guy didn't cry at all. I mean, that is so good and so relatable because I think, when when we're vulnerable, it is like one of the first places to go. It's easier to just get really angry at the person who has put you in the vulnerable position, <laughs> which you didn't. You didn't break right. George's jaw. You didn't. It, but it it was so that part was so relatable. The irrationality of um, of vulnerability and fear and emotion. And I just think I think that's what makes uh, the. Bert's comedy, the stuff that I love the most is the vulnerable stuff. I mean, he, you know, that he talks about um, when he talks about his vulnerabilities, it's just so great because he is this like big, strong bro and um, the vulnerable stuff is just, it's great. I like that too. I like that about him. That is part of the reason I married him because that's actually (laughs) always been there. When we were first dating, we, I'll never forget this. We'd been dating. He was so in love with me from the first day. It was obvious. He called me every morning to ask me what I was doing that night, seven days a week, never missed a day. There was no mystery here. And we'd been dating (laughs) for like three months. We're clearly dating exclusively. I'm seeing him almost every day because he's, you know, a little obsessive and we're at a party and he introduces me as his friend. And I go, Oh honey, I'm your girlfriend. And he goes, no, no, no. I don't like those terms. And I went, well, let me tell you something, buddy. I'm 31 years old and I see you every day. I'm your girlfriend. So you should get used to that term. And he was like, oh, 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 okay. Yeah, I guess you are my girlfriend. But he's just uncomfortable with that feeling of I have a girl. Like now I have this is like a real relationship. But he was able to hear me and go. Yeah, she's she's kind of right. She's right about that. Like I I I I am acting like her boyfriend, so I can just not introduce her as a friend. I was like, I I am your friend, but I am your girlfriend. I mean, you call me by nine thirty every morning. Come on, dude. So that was one of the things that I really fell in love with Bert was because he was scared of his own vulnerability, but willing to kind of look at it and do something else with it. Um, I don't know. Oh, I'm naked, naked, coming through, naked, naked, <laughs> naked, coming through. Some things don't change. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I need socks. He moved me into here so he could work out. Oh, he left my background open, dude. Oh, um, all right. Anything else stand out for you with the book with your little yellow post it notes, which is way better than what I did? <laughs> you always do so much good homework, Kirsten. Just yeah, right? ask the author. <laughs> Let's do a new segment. Look at all my homework. Look at all her homework. 
Any questions you have? <laughs> I didn't think we were going to be uh, have the author in here. Um, Wait, are you guys trashing it? No, no, <laughs> no. We were Not just at talking all. about how you wrote about your vulnerability when uh, Georgia got hurt, and how Ooh. that was really amazing and kind of. Uh, so accurate on how people get angry when they start feeling vulnerable is what Kirsten was saying. Yeah. yeah and I was saying, I would love for you to write a book now because I think that uh, you're, you're a little too vulnerable, <laughs> little too fucking vulnerable. <laughs> I'm a fucking, well, I'd read it right now. <laughs> well, thank you guys for reading my book. I appreciate it. Just, you should know that Leanne pretty much is the reason it got made entirely is that I would write that first draft and give it to Leanne. And then she'd be like, I don't know what these words mean. And I'd be like, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. He tried to voice text it. And I was like, that has to stop today. Yeah. Like your, your stream of consciousness is not even like the English language. Like I can't even <laughs> decipher what you're trying to say in the sentence. So you have to, right? Yeah. yeah. I was, it was bad. Yeah. No, it wasn't bad. It was just, the voice texting was very rambly and very you like, can't voice ah, text a book. No. here's the thing I'll say about writing a book is that you should write it. There's, it's, there's a really big difference between I don't write the way I talk. And, and I, I think I'm a better writer than I am. I'm a better talker than I am writer. If I had to do it again, I would never write another book, although I'm trying to get a book deal right now. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was a lot of time. And in order to be a good writer, there's, that's a different brain. It really is. And uh, and I I'm, I really respect anyone who writes a book. Patton Oswalt's books are amazing. That guy's a fucking writer. Oh yeah. Oh, oh. he but he's a writer and like real writers can take moments that that you wouldn't that are are not worthy of a conversation and turn them into something you never forget. You know, like he had a book in one he had a portion of one of his books about working at a movie theater and just ducking down from the booth so no one could see he was there and taking some time to read and it, the way he wrote the way he wrote it it just was like so you wanted to be there and it's it's something you would never go man you know what i'm looking for today i'm looking to hide out during work <laughs> and read but it made you want to be there and i was like wow that's a good writer i don't think i did that in this book but uh and the next book's a self-help book so we'll see how that goes <laughs> speaking of which i'm getting on the treadmill thank you ladies <laughs> Bye. Uh, yeah i kind of wish you would write another book too because i think he has so many stories i think you should write a book about his adventures with the travel channel uh because there are so many stories that happened for him uh while he was doing her um um shit i forgot the name of the trip flip, trip flip. And, and Bert the conqueror um trip yeah but i think he could pick off where he left pick up where he left off with this book and talk about being married and having kids. And well, uh, it's funny that his description of Patton Oswalt is like taking nothing and making it into a good story, but that's exactly what he does. Like yes. just verbally. Yes. Like that's interesting that that's what he sort of gravitates to. He just uh, expresses it differently than putting it down in writing. Yeah. But I think what Bert is expressing is that Bert's stories are wild and outrageous because he, he wouldn't have been sitting behind the counter reading a book. He would have been like, Hey buddy, like get, you know, getting in with yeah. some outrageous, like he'd find the most outrageous person there and somehow get in with them and they'd go out drinking and do something crazy together. So he'd like create, uh, his personality is just such that he's got a big personality and he wants to create big moments and live a big life. And um, Pat and Oswald is more reflective or whatever, but, but Bert still, I think you're right, Kathy. He still reflects on the moments. It's just that the moments are bigger. I think. Maybe so. <laughs> so before we were interrupted. <laughs> so, so rudely interrupted by the author. By the author. Like, <laughs> who invited that guy? Uh, you know, I hesitated to have him on as a guest with you guys because uh, it would just would have been the bird show. And uh, and I like the Burt Show. The Burt Show's good too. But so I wanted to talk about the book, and I was like, "We'll never get. We'll never. We'll talk about Gelson's the grocery store for an hour. You know, it'll be it'll just be his social time. So maybe we can do that another time. We can do uh, Life of the Party Part Two with 
the life of the party. Um, so what did you have um, post-it noted, my, my, um, my professor friend? <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. So many times. Um, the, the story about Planet Hollywood oh. was so great because I, it's <gasps> like we've all been to that gatekeeper person who's like, uh, no, I don't think this is the, yeah, no, no, you, you don't belong here. Yeah. Will Smith is not here. This is planet Hollywood. We have a cutout of Will Smith and how condescending she was. And he's like, no, I think there's supposed to be a movie theater. This is planet Hollywood. There's no movie theater. And then lo and behold, uh, Mr. Smith will see you downstairs in the oh, private my- movie theater. And then that I was just such a great story. And it was really well told because honestly I was, I mean, he really took us through that story where I was like, oh, wow, Bert's been played by Will Smith. Like, right. and here he is, like the poor guy. I really felt for him, like sitting right. there in the waiting room at Planet Hollywood and like thinking that he's going to see Will Smith there. <laughs> and and it, was not- just, it was also such a sign of the times. Like I remember Planet Hollywood in the 90s in New York and that that was like ooh, going to planet Hollywood but it's such a tourist you know all it is is a tourist trap but it is it is I know that that was a great story is a good hi Mona honey I'm not sure what you need um uh it is is such a window too into his relationship with his dad you know his dad literally said oh dude he wants to fuck you and, you know, this is something that would have never occurred to Bert. Bert is such an innocent in so many ways that, I mean, I didn't know Bert at this time, but I know that that never occurred to Bert. He was never thinking, oh, yeah, he definitely wants to get in my pants. Um, but his dad has always thought about the things that Bert doesn't ever think about. And it's like a catastrophe thinker. Uh, yeah, nobody really thinks you're you know, talented. Yeah, this can't be real. Your luck can't be this good. And then his luck ends up being exactly that good all the time. This happens all the time. So it was an interesting, that was an interesting moment with his dad. Oh, buddy, he wants to fuck you. And I'm like, <laughs> I would never have thought of that either. No. I don't think like that his that. dad would think that way. I don't know why either. I guess he thinks there's no way you're talented. So it's got to be only the only thing is he wants to fuck. Yeah, that was I mean, that was sad for me when I read that. I was like, can't his dad believe in him a little bit? But (laughs) I think, you know, like the the idea is funny. Like, even if, you know, even if you're not into him or whatever, like, you know, I could see his dad being like, oh, okay, maybe your comedy isn't my cup of tea, but he's funny. Like you have to acknowledge that Bert is funny. So it's not a reach to think that Will Smith would want to produce something that Bert's, I don't know. That was, that was sad for me to think that his dad was like, yeah, no, that wouldn't, this isn't real. (laughs) Well, I think his dad comes from such a, uh, straight and narrow background, lawyer, doctor, that's kind of what you did. Banker, lawyer, doctor. Nobody did anything in the arts ever. That's just not a job. That's not a real job. You know, you dilly dally in that for a little bit, but you're going to get a real job at some point. I think was probably not just his dad, but many, many dads, I'm sure of many, many comics have the same perspective. You know, you're funny, but are you that yeah. funny? Because, you know, if you grow up with someone who's always funny, their funny is just who they are. It's not particularly spectacular because it's just who they are. Well, and also comedy changed so much from like his dad may have been like Bob Newhart is funny. Yes. And it doesn't mean that Bob Newhart isn't funny, but like comedy changed a lot. And also there's a lot of different ways to be funny. And the way that Bert is funny is not Bob Newhart funny. No, for or sure. whatever, like whoever it would have been in like his day. Um, yeah, probably Bob Newhart. So, yeah. That's probably a good guess. Um, Mona is driving me nuts. You know, if it's not <laughs> one dog, it's another. She's standing at the door barking at it. You can't hear. She's going, hey, hey. So I'm going to let her outside. <laughs> Mona, you're killing me. Come on. Let's go. Outside. I need my own podcast studio. 
There's too many animals in my house. <laughs> okay. What else did you have? That may be your own fault. Um, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it may be my fault. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> This, the one story that I don't have anything particularly flagged because I just love the whole thing was the honeymoon with Danny and Dawn. Oh um, my God. So great. The whole thing. And it was just so well told. And you re- like, he painted such a picture of how exclusive this resort was and how in over your heads you guys felt and him with this case of beer feeling like looking like Uncle Eddie. <laughs> from vacation rolling into this five-star resort. It was just, and then Danny and Don were so, to find someone there who was maybe more outrageous than Bert was such a great thing because Bert is, you know, usually the biggest, most outrageous personality in the room. For and sure. then, so to have Danny, this older guy, it was just, that was so fabulous. And it was really well told. I just loved that story. It was a crazy moment in time. That was a crazy, that whole experience. We were really, he did tell it exactly the way it was. We were really out of our depth. I mean, a fi- I paid for our wedding. It was $5,000. And it like, I mean, it was difficult. It was really difficult. My dad helped. My dad paid for the DJ. And helped with little nuts and bolts here and there. But I paid for everything else. And um, when we got that bill, I will never forget that feeling. Because Al kept saying, nope, I got it covered. It's handled. It's don't worry about it. It's going to be half price. And even at half price, I was hesitant. I was like, this is almost as much as our wedding. Like still, I'm not, I'm not completely on board with this, but Bert kept going, but we're not paying for flights, but we're not paying for this, but we're not paying for that. You know, he has this way of talking me into bad ideas that end up being good on a regular basis where I have to put my own pragmatic mind aside and just walk forward. Nine times out of 10, it's with the campers where we're doing something where I go, this is a bad idea. And then I go ahead and do it anyway. We ended up having a blast and it cost us three times as much money as we expected. And, you know, and then we're making French dinner instead of just whatever. (laughs) That honeymoon, that whole, he really did write that like it happened. It was a crazy moment in time. Um, I think it might've been my first crazy story with him. Like where something happened where you're like, this is a story. Um, His life seems to be a series of big stories, Um, more so than most, I think. Definitely. I'm glad you liked that story. It was a good one. Yeah. So good. It was was accurate. (laughs) There were just, there were a lot of really funny lines that I flagged too, like in the bear part, (laughs) when the producer is... um, they're saying like he he's got to do this trust exercise with the bear with the putting a marshmallow in his mouth and the bear eating the marshmallow out of its mouth which is so absurd it's this giant bear and um then and the producer's saying the bear has to trust you if you want to fight it and he says tim i want to trust the fucking bear before he trusts me and then the producer says trust needs to go both ways (laughs) (laughs) i just I died laughing over that, like going, thinking like a Bert in this outrageous situation and like he's being schooled on trust. And it's like, what? <laughs> right. It's a grizzly bear. Let's all <laughs> keep it straight. This is a grizzly bear. Yeah. That whole day was insane. I was, oh. I was at part of that day. I didn't see the lion taming part of that day, but I came for the bear, obviously. But the whole time I was going, who thought this was a good idea? This man has major allergies. He has no large animal experience. Like he didn't grow up on a farm or anything. Not that a large grizzly bear and a large Brahma bull are the same, but they are both very large animals who can kill you. And there's a way that you behave around those animals. And if you're not, there seemed to be like no preparation other than this one marshmallow trust exercise. It was like, (laughs) oh, you did a marshmallow trust exercise with the bear and then suddenly like you're trained. It was like that. That was no training at all. So he, a little, there, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh no. There's just a part when he, 
he reflects on it that was so good. I, you know, I just took this memoir class and I've been like knee deep in memoir that I was like, this is, this is so, this reflection was so good. He um, talks about the feeling of there's no better feeling than finishing a day of work and cracking a cold one with the crew. Um, the bear had the same ritual, do your job, get a marshmallow, pat on the forehead and a slow walk to the cage. I found a moment of solidarity with the bear. We were compadres, co-workers, doing a job for our handlers, a job they couldn't do. Uh, it so That was so great. I mean, summed up that whole experience because, yeah, when I was reading it, I was like, oh, my God, they're just like, first of all, I can't believe that this was even allowed, that, yeah. like, you know, that somebody can own an exotic animal and go, oh, yeah, you can fight this guy who has no training with bears and then but also that they were putting Bert in this situation like I get that it was for this outrageous tv show but still I was like oh my god are there no limits like this is right I I felt very unsafe about the whole thing but it's so true it's like doing they were they were both being handled and that is what it's like to be an actor or a star on something it's that handlers and that was such a great reflection that I wouldn't have thought of that was just like a deeper level of what was going on and how he felt that he basically felt like a trained animal, you know? Right. right. That, that, that okay. whole show hurt Bert. I a hundred million times kept saying, I protest. I protest. This is a bad idea. He got hurt really badly twice. Once when he was playing with the Avengers the LA Avengers, he came home from that playing um, arena football and they were playing football with him who has no training, has never played football. And he was banged up for, I mean, like visibly injured from head to toe, nothing broken, but like contusions and bruises and scrapes. And he really, they really played football with him. And the second one, is, I mean, before he even left, they took him to Texas to be a rodeo clown. And I said, I think that is the worst idea I've ever heard. You do not know anything. I grew up with, my grandfather was a cattle farmer. I I herded his cattle from pasture to pasture. I walked around in pastures with big Brahma bulls. I am not an expert person. It wasn't, you know, my whole life, but I definitely, when you grow up in that environment, you have a certain instinct about large animals. You're taught how to behave around them. And it becomes kind of instinctual. So even now when I go home and uh, my uncle Danny has a pasture field full of cows, I know how to read them a little bit and say, we need to start moving over here. You know, they're, they're, they're close enough, but if you don't have that and you have fear, animals know when you're afraid. And I was like, this is going to be so bad. And he, sure enough, he got totally mauled by a bull, broke his ribs, broke a, broke his foot, stepped on his foot, ran completely over him. And that was the last episode of that series. And they never aired it because it was so bad. So I hated Hurt Bert. I hated it. It was so awful. As awful as some of the stuff he did on Travel Channel and as, as reckless as they were with his health and safety, Hurt Bert was terrible. Uh, and that was before we had kids. That was when we were still dating. And I kept going, you are just crazy. But secret time, not secret time. About two weeks after Bert shot that with the bear, the bear killed his trainer. That's terrible. Bear killed his trainer and they had to put the bear down. Oh, my God. There were two bears, Pebbles and Bam Bam. Pebbles is obviously female and bam bam and bam bam is who bert was working with and they were doing a feature film and um bam bam just killed his trainer while filming (laughs) so crazy when we found that i was like oh my god bam bam was holding on by a thread and you were putting marshmallows in your mouth and oh my god crazy how scary as unsafe as it seems that's really how unsafe it was. Killed his trainer. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that whole story, like with then the trainer saying, like, everybody's laughing as Bert's getting tossed around by this bear. And 
then the trainer is like looking deathly serious at him and saying, go limp, go limp. And I was like, and Bert reflects on this, that it's like, well, why didn't he ever mention going limp before? Before. Like there, it just really underlined how little training there was. And the whole thing, like just driving out to that, that place and all of those animals and yeah, uh, that's depressing. Wow. That's really crazy. Right. That's I wonder, I've, I've often wondered what happened to all of his animals. He had a ton. He had like panthers and lions and uh, elephants. And um, I don't remember what else, but there were a lot of exotic animals that he had trained. I mean, on that same day, Bert like washed an elephant, you know, like scrubbed down an elephant. And he trained a bunch of lions. He had, they gave him like a fanny pack with meat in it and put him in the ring <laughs> in a stick with a nail on it. And that's how he was supposed to deal with a lion. <laughs> I'm like, what do you do with a stick with a nail on it? It's a lion. If he wants to eat you, you're dead. You're done. There's three of them in the cage with him too. Three lions and Bert and a meat fanny pack and a stick with a nail on it. Yeah, it was, it was, all the whole thing was insane. So how does this one person get himself in all these situations over and over? Clearly he draws them to himself. Clearly he does, but he explains in it that he, um, I don't remember which friend of his says early on, um, when I think when they're traveling and I don't know when they go to Philadelphia or something and his friend says, no, I'm going to yes. And everything like the improv thing, like, no, you never say no, you just yes. And, and then Bert says that he starts doing that. And I think he is a yes. And like, instead of, like most of us who would go fight a bear or, you know, any of these outrageous situations, like doing drugs with uh, Tracy Morgan or whatever, like going, uh, no, thanks. I'll pass. He's like, he's not the no thanks guy. He's the yes. And okay. And, and what's next? (laughs) Yes. Yes. And what can we add to this to make it more fun? Yeah. Hence our French cuisine. (laughs) Santa. (laughs) That we're now filming behind the scenes because, yes, and we're now going to make this some kind of web series. (laughs) Not really, but. (laughs) Kathy, I find it really fascinating and not at all surprising that Stephen was very much the same person. This is one of the reasons that they're good friends. Yes. Is they're cut from the same cloth. Yes, that is definitely uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, I mean, obviously he has not had the same experiences or whatever, but it, that mentality, especially, you know, 20 some odd years ago was a hundred percent the same, you know? So then uh, why you are so pragmatic, level-headed, logical thinker. Why did you stick with that crazy guy? He wore me down. <laughs> <laughs> That's I know. Okay. He wore me down until I was like, fine. <laughs> fine. My outsider opinion on this is that they both adore you both. Yes. And that, <laughs> you know, that's, you know and the other piece is tell. that there is the other side. So there is the like eat shit, fuck party side. And then there is the actual vulnerable, like really sweet, genuine amazing human side yeah. that may not always get seen by everyone, but when you see it, you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. This is, this is why I'm here. This is the part. The rest of it is like noise that I could possibly do without, but it just comes with the package. So, but could we really, because I think if I didn't yeah. have that noise, I'd be bored to death. If I was in charge of driving everything, I'm in charge of driving enough. Don't get me wrong. But if I was in charge of driving everything. I don't think I would like that. Like if we're going on vacation, I just step aside. Bert is going to figure out where we're going, what we're doing, how long we're staying, where we're staying. Uh, he, he, uh, we're buying a car. I have to kind of step aside. So there's some of those things where I think internally, I must really enjoy that having someone go because I would buy the cheapest vacation package with the smallest room and shove every person in it and eat bologna sandwiches for a week because I'm like, this is too much money. 
We can't, even though we could afford to do anything, my mentality still is tempered. That's everything should be tempered. Just be careful, be tempered. We don't want to blow everything, you know, whereas Bird is like, why? We earn it. We earn this money. We can afford it. We should enjoy it. And I don't think I would have that in my life if I were the one fully in charge of everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I could say the same thing about our some of the cuisine that he cooks. I am such a boring cook. I do not enjoy cooking. I just want to put food in my belly. And if it tastes good, bonus. That's not the way Bert is. Bert's like, let's make something that's amazing because we're going to have to make something anyway. And I'm like, I don't have the bandwidth for that. Just where's a hot dog? Let's perfect. Let's make some hot dogs. And he doesn't do that. So I think that exciting part of him that goes through the Poconos and makes up a story and spends a night in somebody's trailer he doesn't know is the part that also makes a fabulous dinner that also says, let's go snow skiing every year and a ski in ski out place where I was like, oh, we can't afford a ski in ski out place. No way. And he goes, yeah, we can. Let's do it. Do you feel that way, Kathy? Uh, for some things, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. Like, I definitely get pushed outside of my comfort box. Yeah. Because I wouldn't if somebody didn't force me to, which is probably good and probably very healthy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He does not plan our vacations, though. <laughs> <laughs> But he does different things. He does say, we are going to be fully in charge of the fundraiser at our school for multiple years and run everything at our elementary school. He's a dumbass. Yes. But no, because he loves that party mentality. And that, I'm sorry, that fundraiser was really hard work, the fair, and it was really fun. It was both. And how many people did I meet from that environment? So many great friends from that environment. And I guarantee you that was Stephen Fromkin because he was like, president, (laughs) I'm president. Oh, again, I'll be president. One more year, president. You need another year, president, you know? Yep, there is that. (laughs) (laughs) Not that you wouldn't have volunteered, but. Yeah, but I don't need to be president. No, but he (laughs) he was like, we are, by the way, Kathy, all in. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. What else in this book, Kirsten? What else do you have? My help. I'm going to say uh, one of the best things about this book, Kirsten keeps bringing it up, but one of the best things I think about this book, you know, so many of these stories are out there. He's told whatever, but like, there's so much in here that is his thought process behind it, his feelings, his emotions that you don't get when you see him on stage or whatever, you know what I mean? So while the stories may seem familiar, there's so much more to it, which I think is really cool. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's the best part about this book where there's like, I don't want to say the more human side, but you see like the not necessarily funny piece of it. You see like his actual emotions and thoughts, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I totally agree, Kathy. And, and, but even a lot of that stuff is funny. Like the, you know, even his reflections and his, the way he sees things, they're still funny. It's just funny in a different way. Like, Yeah, well, like thinking he and the bear are on the same page, like we're compadres. <laughs> you're like, no, no, you're really not. <laughs> but you know, like just that perspective, walking away from it, seeing that it is very similar. They are both being handled, you know. Yeah, and Bert is a bear. Just a human, <laughs> he's a human bear. Yeah. He's just a big human bear. Um, okay, what's your other post-it note, Kirsten? Uh, okay. Um... Oh, oh, this was so great. Um, <laughs> when he talks about um, Georgia and Isla, that, you know, the baby's born and they're, she's crying and it's like, ah, I, you know, I want my mom to take care of this. <laughs> like, And then like, oh, wait a minute, I'm the dad. I've got to take care of this and taking care of it. And then the same thing happening with Isla. And um, he's, he says, I, this time I wasn't scared of the unknown. Instead, all I could think to myself was, why the fuck did I do this again? Must be how you feel when you wake up hungover with a brand new face tattoo. I couldn't wait to look at it, but the idea of living it with it was overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great way of putting it. That is not the way that was, you know, not my birth experience. But again, like, it's so, it's such a relatable way of, of looking at things. Like, getting a tattoo that you're like, 
you're committed, but then you're like, oh, what was, know, I thinking? what was I thinking? The idea of living with it is overwhelming. <laughs> That's such a great way to put it. <laughs> you know, the thing about kids for Bert, I think, is that it is overwhelming. The feelings they evoke in him are completely overwhelming. And I mean that from the most positive feelings to the most negative feelings. For Bert, they are, I think, more powerful than any other feelings he has are the ones that are related to our children. And maybe that's true with everybody, but I, I don't know. I don't, it's different for him in that if Georgia hurts my feelings, I know she's a child. And I know she's not meaning to hurt my feelings. And even if she is, I'm her mom. And that's kind of that's kind of the deal we made, right? That is not how it happens for Bert Kreischer. If she hurts his feelings, it's almost like God hurt his feelings. It's such a deep and personal pain. And I don't know that he has experienced that really anywhere else. Like when I hurt him, it's pretty deep and personal too. But it's not the same. And I think a lot of his defensiveness comes from that intensity of emotion um, and his kind of larger than lifeness is protecting that really sensitive piece. And a lot of it's related directly to his kids. I mean, if if he wants to watch a movie and they have homework, you would think they broke up with him. <laughs> Like you would think they're like, yeah, I'm just not that into you and I'm going to move on when they just have fucking homework where you're like, dude, do something else with your night. Like, I don't, I don't, why would I take that personally? They just have homework. They're not saying, I don't want, it's finals week. It's happened several times this week. And I'm like, they're in finals. Are you saying they should choose you over their English final? No, it's not going to happen. Oh, you just don't want to spend any time with me. And I'm like, oh, my God, dude, he has doesn't have the ability. It, ha it showed up really when kids showed up, I think, for him, where he had this small person inside that's just so in love with those small people that he can't be a big person and regulate it sometimes. Sometimes he's great. And sometimes you go, wow, that is really not necessary. But. <laughs> We had Georgia. I had a diff terrible birth experience and I was not able to get up and take care of her. And she was in the room with us. And he literally told me his brain said that when it happened. He was like laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? He was like, I literally thought to myself, mom, mom, are you going to get that mom? And he was like, I haven't lived with my mom in like how many years? Like I, but I can't call for you. You're obviously not able to move. So the next person is mom. He's like, I can't believe I thought this. This is actually me. No, it's me. Actually, me. And he literally looked at me when Isla started crying when we had her, and he went, "Why did we do this again? This was really stupid." <laughs> and I, I was thinking to myself, "You didn't do anything the first time. Why do you think you're doing something this time? It's about me. It's not about you." You, you're just, you're going to be running interference with a two-year-old, which you're going to have a good time with. I'm the one that has to feed this one and care for it. Anyway, he is so funny. Uh, I'm glad that he expressed that too, because I, not just in that specific situation, but in general, I don't think people say enough about the negative parts of your psyche that show up when you have a baby. It is beautiful and wonderful, and it is a love like nothing else. And it is, can be sometimes soul sucking, exhausting. It can make you feel lost, unappreciated, unloved. It Isolated. Can, it, yes, it can make you exasperated. It can make you hate yourself. It can make you hate your spouse. It can make you hate your children. It can make you hate teachers who are doing the best they can. I mean, there are all these negative pieces of being a parent that no one ever talks about, or they don't talk about, or I don't hear people talk about it. And especially in the context of this is one piece of a large pie, and most of the pie is positive. 
But if you don't acknowledge this one piece that fucking sucks, then it sucks more than if you just acknowledge it and say, this piece fucking sucks. What did we do to ourselves? We just got Georgia sleeping all night long and now we have another one and we got sleeping all night long again for years now. What were we thinking? Of course, that should be part of the conversation. But, you know, everybody thinks it's just moonlight and roses. And it is most of the time. But sometimes it fucking sucks, especially teenagers. Oh, my God. <laughs> Some of this teenager stuff. Where I'm, I, I want to. I think I, I think I need a T-shirt that says, do you think I'm an asshole? Or do you think I'm an idiot? Or the problem is the answer, bank. <laughs> the answer is yes to all three of those questions. No, the answer is not. But they, it is yes. They do think they do think that, though. <laughs> I'm like, I need a T-shirt that says, do you think I'm an asshole? Because you're talking to me like I'm an asshole. And all I did was say, hey, is your homework done? I'm not an asshole for asking that. I'd like to like watch a movie with you, but I'm not going to start it till you're done with homework. That's great to talk about because I've had that same conversation with my kids so many times. And it does like you feel isolated when it's happening as if, oh, it's only me and my kids who are going through this. It's only my, you know, I'm the only asshole (laughs) around, but apparently Leanne's an asshole too. And maybe Kathy is too. (laughs) I think we are all assholes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But but you're right. That is something I hadn't thought about talking about that, but maybe we should podcast about that because Bert really feels like Georgia only talks to him that way and nobody else's teenager talks to their parent that way. And I say to him constantly, Uh, she's 16. And then he'll call his dad and go, can you believe Georgia said this to me? And his dad will go, oh, you don't remember. (laughs) This made me laugh so hard. (laughs) Bert had eight, eight car accidents. And like the first year he was driving. <laughs> and one day he came home and he was like, Dad, I need to tell you something. I've had another car accident. And his dad got really mad. God damn it, Burton. He was like, hey, Dad, it's not called a purpose. It's called an accident. It was an accident. You can't get mad at me for an accident. And I was like, and you're mad at Georgia because of the shit she says to you. And you would say that to your dad. It's not called a purpose. It's called an accident. <laughs> Like you're an idiot. I can just see him getting like this. It's not called a purpose, you know, with his dad getting all righteous about his argument that this was not a purpose. It was and then will not see that his kid is just doing the same thing. She's doing the same thing. I can tell from your breath out, Kathy, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. Teenagers suck. I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. I don't know. And during a pandemic, it's not easy. Like, yeah. ugh, it all sucks right now. It's been really hard. They are challenging. Anything else we want to say about life of the party? It's worth reading. I mean, I think it's you're fun. in college and you're a male. Whatever. <laughs> well, I think that, any, but also anybody who is a fan of Bert or a fan of you, because even though he doesn't know you for like half of the book, and even though he's on the road, you're still a part of it. Like you're yeah. still present in the book. And um, it's just, it, it's interesting to see, to see the dynamic and to see the dynamic that has always been there. <laughs> It has always been there, hasn't it? Isn't it funny? I don't know what it is about me that I I would like to think about myself that I try and accept people as who they show me they are and not try to have too much judgment on that. I can choose not to hang out with that, which is different than judging that. I mean, obviously, I'm not a perfect person. I do have judgment on people. That's impossible not to be judgy. But that's what I try to do. You know, there's several people in our neighborhood where I go, that's not for me. But you go on, fly your freak flag all day long, and we'll talk about your freak flag. Happy to talk about it. But I'm not going to hang out with it. And that's cool, right? And I think I kind of do that with Bert. There's some things I just don't hang out with in his world. 
And I don't see that that as a married couple, we have to hang out with every piece of each other. I just don't think that that is healthy. No, Um, it's not realistic and it's not healthy. Like, I think it's great when we're each bringing something different to the table, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It is. And, you know, I wonder what people think that I think about his lifestyle and how he drinks and, and how he parties and how he's on the road all the time. And my philosophy has always been, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. If you're healthy, if you're going to see your doctor regularly and the doctor is saying that your body is healthy, if you are showing up to work on time, if you are parenting your kids relatively effectively with positivity to positivity most of the time, if you're not abusing your spouse, if you have friends that stick around, if you're a functioning person, then all these things um, aren't really my business. They're my business, but they're not where I go. If your cardiologist did a full body scan on you and you are healthy as hell, what am I to say? I mean, I'm concerned that over time this will affect your health, but it doesn't affect your behavior that that much from time to time. It does, but not on a regular basis. So why am I worried about it? Why would I try to control that person when there's so many positive things about that person and a couple of worrisome things? I'm sure I have some worrisome things also. Um, Our friend was very injured recently, (laughs) badly injured. And I, we went to help him when he was coming home from the emergency room. And I just looked at him and all of a sudden out of my mouth went, yeah, this is really bad. And I thought later, I I probably shouldn't have said that. That was probably bad. So I'm definitely not perfect either. I might be a little blunt sometimes when I shouldn't be. And I'm sure he looks at me and goes, how did I marry this person? Who would say that that obviously this is really bad? (laughs) But I just was kind of overwhelmed with how bad it really is pretty bad. So I don't know. Anyway, I don't know what the point of (laughs) making that is. But um, what I, uh, something that I thought about when I was reading this book is how I think I, t- we t- I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I really want to hear what you guys think about this is that how, how are boys supposed to be in this world? Like if a boy thinks like Bert, eat, sleep, drink, fuck, I just want to get in a girl's pants. I mean, this is going to sound like a dumb question, but what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Like, what piece of that should we embrace? I I have these thoughts, and I know this is not very politically correct, but I have this thoughts of, like, him wanting to get in my pants is a compliment on some levels. It means I'm desirable, right? If he didn't want to get in my pants, I wouldn't be desirable. Not that that's my entire self-esteem or all of my worth. But it's part of like, obviously, I'm sexy, sensual, desirable, um, attractive. And those things do mean something to me. They don't mean everything to me, but they do mean something. So how is a boy, because arguably in this book, Bird is a boy, not a man. How is a boy supposed to figure that out? You know, Does does my question even make sense? Yeah. I have a 16 year old boy. Like we struggle with that. Like, you know, Steven said something to him the other day and I don't know what it was, but it was, he made a joke that was completely inappropriate. I I don't know. Like it was like a college joke or whatever, or he made a reference to something. And I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, but this is where he's at. And I'm not condoning. Like that's the tricky part because he is a 16 year old boy. I'm sure he's thinking about fucking and drinking and smoking and like all of that shit, like every other 16 year old at this point. But how do you accept that that's what they're thinking about and translate that into, you still have to be a decent stand up man. Yeah. 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 
like, cause there's a difference between yeah. the, your thought process and who you are as a human, like right. the fact that you're like, why the fuck did we have a second kid when right. really genuinely you want that second kid desperately, but you're like, oh my God, what the hell were we thinking? Like, right. how do you get them to accept like thoughts are okay, but you don't necessarily act on that. Like you don't just try to get into a girl's pants. Right, right, right. You know? Like it's a struggle. It's a huge struggle. And I feel like you're not allowed to talk about that. I feel like boys aren't allowed to say like, I just really want to fuck her. Right, not right. I ever want to hear those words out of my son's mouth? I'll be honest. <laughs> like, I no, 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 no. But, but my, my point is some of this is just basic biology, right? We're put on this planet to make babies. So at this age, boys are supposed to be driven by this sex drive, right? And how did we get to a place where it, I feel like we're in a place now in society where that sex drive is under every circumstances deemed as demeaning to the woman? When I don't think it is in every circumstance demeaning to the woman, there are circumstances where it is. But I feel like the conversation that happens now where any like, hey, baby, if you're not married is like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, that don't you don't talk to me that way. But some of it, the cute flirtations that I remember in high school would not be acceptable today. And I still don't see those cute flirtations that happened in high school as inappropriate. I didn't feel demeaned. I didn't feel looked at as a piece of meat. I didn't feel like I was a piece of meat. I feel like this guy was going, hey, I think you're cute. I mean, as yeah, simple as that. I think I see it a little differently um, because I don't think that those are inappropriate now. Um, okay. I, I, I don't think that flirtation or like, I think that the, the distinction is like the workplace stuff where you feel threatened and can't, if, if something is uncomfortable, um, something becomes like sort of more dangerous. I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like there's still a place for, you know, for flirtation and outrageousness and inappropriateness. Um, yeah. In high school and know. beyond. I don't know. I don't know. I don't see that freedom. I don't see that freedom happening. Yeah. You know why? I have some very empowered girls in my house who put up with none of it. And I'm like, that's really unfortunate because some of that is the boys telling you you're sexy. He's not saying I'm going to pin you against the wall and fuck you against your will. He's basically saying, I desire you. No. And, you know, you're like, well, that that's not healthy either. Right. There's got to be some. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be, you know. Falling in love and that in high school, I mean, I was in love with my boyfriend and, and I had all these other boys I flirted with and I don't see that happening. I see a, in, in the young ladies that I observe, I see a lot of like, just so you know, I am running this show and what I say and what I deem is appropriate is what it is. And I'm like, hmm, but that's really discounting the other sex's experience, right? And we both know men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Women have different priorities. So do men. Men's are not invalid. Men's, men's are not invalid. Women's are not invalid. How do we, but I feel like women's, have be, women's um, needs and priorities have become so validated that men don't have a place to go with theirs. Does that make sense? Or if they say, hey, I think you're foxy, you've just cat called her. Or you're like, you know, not that any kid would say, hey, I think you're foxy, but you, you get what I'm saying, right? I want to hook up with you or, or I want to make out. Like when Sandy met Tom, the first thing Tom said to her was, do you want to go on the balcony and like suck face? And she was like, yeah. Like, would that happen today with our kids? Like, how would the girl receive that? I mean, and Sandy and Tom fell in love, have two kids, been married for they've been together 20 years. So maybe that doesn't work for someone else, but clearly that worked for them, right? Hey, you want to go on the balcony and suck face? Yeah, 
and they went on the balcony and sucked face and then ended up getting married. And they were in their 30s, you know, <laughs> very immature exchange happened. But I that is my question. Would that exchange happen now and it not be deemed just what it is? Don't know. I don't know. I yeah, I I don't know. I maybe I'm living in a, a weird a sheltered world, but I feel like it's still like that could still happen. I don't know. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope stuff like that can happen because the way I feel feel about it is if a young lady is confident in who she is and knows what she wants and she doesn't want, she can take or leave whatever is offered, right? If someone says you want to go out on the balcony and suck face, she can go pass. <laughs> no, but I can be your friend. Maybe that's thinking too much instead of being like, oh, my God, I am not that person. You know, uh, this righteousness that seems. Yeah, to but be- you're I guess it, it's also that's also righteousness coming from a 16 year old, which, you know, that will evolve over time. Like her her response to that might evolve over time. And at some point she might find the humor and be like, uh, no, that's a pass. But her 16 okay. year old response right now is just like. That is outrageous, hard no, right. goodbye. And right. that's just like part of her development. Right. Um, well, I'm not saying this. I don't want any fans to think I'm talking about Georgia. I'm actually not. I'm talking about she has a large group of girlfriends. I'm talking about one of her friends that has been dabbling in the world of boys. As far as I know, Georgia's not really dabbling in the world of boys much. Um, but this is a friend of hers that's in the neighborhood that I've been listening to Georgia tell me stories about. And I'm like, ah, huh, interesting. Interesting how that's playing out. It seems to be playing out with a couple different girls in the neighborhood where they're just. I also wonder if that girl, though, is sort of talking big for her, like the equivalent of locker room talk, but like the politically correct locker. Do you know what I mean? Like saying. And so I told him, (laughs) hell no. Do you know what I mean? But really, what did she say? She might have been like. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's a good point. It just was concerning because, you know, I have girls. I don't want girls to feel violated, uh, stomped on. I, but also, I don't want boys to feel like they they can't just, you know, like you said, have the thought, not necessarily act on it, but have some way of saying, hey. I like you, you know, I don't, I, it, I don't know how it works these days. Maybe I feel for boys in this environment. I feel for boys like this boy is not going to exist with, I'm going to go to a bar and hook up with a chick and, you know, and it's going to be over. I don't, I just don't feel like that's a safe a possible thing anymore. And, you know, the, the girls clearly were consenting in his book. There was no, nothing shady going on or anything like that. There wasn't even a lot of that, honestly. I was he's scared to death of disease. <laughs> <laughs> he's death, he's going to get a disease. So he never slept around much because he was terrified he would get. That's why half the stories are about finger popping. <laughs> when you get a disease on your finger, <laughs> treat it with some Lotrimin and you're done. But disease on the dick? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I guess that's a place where anxiety plays a healthy role. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think Oh, I probably shouldn't tell that story. <laughs> uh, I think he had a one night stand once and was 100% convinced he had genital warts and then just obsessive compulsively inspected his genitalia until he made them raw <laughs> and had to go to the doctor. <laughs> to get medication <laughs> because he couldn't stop inspecting himself because he was convinced convinced that he was either dying of AIDS or <laughs> from one so yeah that might have been helpful <laughs> never dull ladies never dull <laughs> never a dull moment wow well I appreciate you reading the book thank you very much Thank you for reading it again, Kathy. I had fun reading it again. And I literally went, 
who did I marry? A. <laughs> B. How was this book published? There's no way they'd publish it today. It's not even that racy. There's just a lot of like, I wanted to bang guts and fuck pussy and pop pussy and finger blast. And it's like, so, you know, not very PC. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I appreciate it. What's our next book club book? What are we going to read now? I don't know. I'm not even reading anything good. I had an author reach out and ask if we would read a book. It is another self-help book. I don't know if you guys are interested in that. Um, what kind of book? It's about um, organizing your time, maximizing Ooh. your time. It sounds it's, like something we're into. <laughs> uh, it is. We've done a book or two about that. I can't remember the name of the book. I'm going to very quickly go to my – no, I shouldn't waste time doing that while we're on here. I should have looked it up before our – session, but maybe I'll, I'll text you and see if you're interested in that book. And if you are, we can have her on like we did with Brooke and talk to the author. Oh. Yeah. She asked me if we could do that sometime in January. And I was like, Oh, I'll put it to the ladies, but if not, I'll do it by myself. So if you're not interested, I'll just do it with her by myself. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. I miss you. I miss you too. Yeah. It'd be nice to do one of these in person. See you guys for real. That'd be fun. Wouldn't it be fun? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even ask you to make me a French meal, Kirsten. <laughs> Thank God. You could just show up. <laughs> Wait a minute. Does Canadian count as French? And can you cook something for me tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if I don't see you, I don't know when this comes out. I think this comes out on Christmas. So I'm wearing my Christmas flannel. So... <laughs> Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy oh, Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. You're almost out of Hanukkah, right? It's done. Last it night was last candle. I thought it was today. Oh, well. well happy. Yeah, it ends today, but there are no more candles. We're done. Oh, got it. All right. Well, miss you guys. I love you. Thank you for always coming along with my antics. You know what I'm ready to do is get back into our adventure podcasts, rock climbing, <laughs> flash. I'm dying to drive a race car. I'm like, what is our next adventure? Well, I, I, I have race car. I met a girl that is on a roller derby team here, but the older I'm getting, I'm think I'm getting scared. You know, Tom, who got so terribly injured a week or so ago, makes me really concerned about doing something like roller derby. <laughs> I, I'm concerned about that. I've had two knee surgeries and I did not, I haven't really bounced back. <laughs> yeah. That well, so. Maybe not roller derby, but uh, race car. Would you be interested in driving NASCAR? Yeah. So when it opens back up, we don't crash. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you control the gas pedal. So I think if you can slow it down, Kathy. Excellent. Then you'd be all right. So we should start thinking of stuff. So in 2022, <laughs> when we can actually do, that, we're ready. <laughs> we'll be so ready. Oh, well, Merry Christmas, guys. And Merry I will Christmas, see guys. Merry Christmas. See you next year. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 bye.